are live. Welcome to Solo Review and Thoughts, a Star Wars story. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, a spin-off about a legacy Star Wars character performed so badly that Disney moved that kind of Star Wars story to Disney Plus for the future. For the foreseeable future, at the very least. Yes, today we're talking about the movie Solo, which is, of course, the numero uno Solo Han, Han Solo movie. Now, since we're talking Star Wars, I don't ha hate fans of any of the trilogies or the trilogies themselves. I don't think that the any of the fandoms are purely made up of people who hate those who disagree with them or have other values than them. If you express a viewpoint that disagrees with what I say in this video, the only thing I ask is that you keep it respectful and I will answer respectfully. If you write something hateful, whether it's against me or anyone else, I will most likely just ignore you. Now, there are several YouTubers who have made good videos where they talk about why this movie did not make a lot of money, so I'm not going to spend very much time on it at all. I might not talk about it at all. Now... I, I will quote, one, one critic said, there were too many Star Wars movies within too short a span of time, and a big chunk of the audience were simply too exhausted to go watch this one the way that they had watched the others. And it is Black History Month, and Lando Calrissian is a badass. And we will be talking about him for some of this video. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the view, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I am currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch. So when I speak faster, until my back feels better. And... I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler. So you, so you can mute and skip ahead and so you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in this fan franchise. Not ones released later, but set earlier. Only ones released earlier, even if some are set later. And as soon as I end the review itself, please note, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. I don't have any personal issues with almost any filmmakers, and I almost never let any issues I might have interfere with my review and analysis. This movie did not ruin my life, my childhood, my day, etc. Now, I personally don't mind when, you know, people who aren't big fans of Star Wars review them, comment on them, that sort of thing. But I know that for some people, it is important that only fans do this sort of thing. So. I want to underline, I criticize a number of Star Wars things, but I am a really big fan of some Star Wars. I have watched all the movies now except for Episode 9. And the... let's see... right, so... Episodes 4 and 5, to me, are a perfect 10 out of 10. Episode 6 is a 6. All three prequels are 5s. Episode 7 is a 7, Rogue 1 is an 8, Episode 8 is a 10. This particular movie, I th think I will hold off on. I'll, I'll, I'll know exactly what I want to give it when I'm done with the review itself. So, ranking them worst to best other than this one in Episode 9. 2, 3, 1, 6, 7, R-O, sorry, Rogue 1, 4, 5, and 8. Now, my making jokes in this video should not necessarily be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad. I simply find it very difficult not to MSC3K and overanalyze everything I watch. So, content warning and or trigger warning for torture, kidnapping, ableism, gaslighting, Murder, body horror, 
slavery, and bullying and other abuse. Now, this movie is rated PG-13, and so is this video. And this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. It's the most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, like clips from the movie, in another tab. I won't mind. Now, I streamed this movie and thus didn't pay anything extra to watch it. So anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other parts of the franchise the trailers and other marketing. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this video are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Now, in a lot of ways, this movie is like A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, and Rogue One, so I'm not going to mention all the things where they're similar. I'm going to talk about the ways that they are different from one another, so I'm not just repeating myself. You don't need to have watched anything else before watching this movie I will say I think you should have watched episodes 4 through 6 since there's a lot of things in this movie that, I mean, I don't know that you'll necessarily like them more if you watch those movies first, but certainly the, the movie is made for people who already watched those movies. There, there are things in this movie that you should know about before you watch it. And I do think the... I'm not the first person to point out there's way too much fan service in this movie, so I'm not going to spend forever talking about it or pointing out every single instance or anything. I do appreciate that technically this could be the first thing you watch. It's clearly made for people who watched the, you know, yeah. Episodes 4 through 6 at the very least. But, yeah, hypothetically, you know, if someone has watched nothing Star Wars, this could be the first thing they, they watch. I don't know if it's the best idea. I don't know if they're particularly going to want to watch anything else Star Wars. You know, I, I I realize some people like to to start with the prequels. I've, I maintain, if you want to introduce someone to Star Wars... Show them a new hope. If they, if if that simply isn't, if if that doesn't really get them interested, then Star Wars is probably not really for them. And at least you won't have, you won't leave them hanging. You know, they'll have the the full story because that one is that that one is sufficiently self-contained. Now, I. Th and, and if you show them that one, then you can tell them the next one's even better. So. But, but yeah, you know, if you watch this after having watched the other movies, it's kind of like a... You know, it's, it's like you're watching it with someone who's constantly, like whispering to you, oh, remember that, remember that, which is annoying, but, I mean, at least there's this sense that, like, they, you know, the people, yeah, the people, you get the sense that the people who made this love the original trilogy, you know, and that is nice, at least. And that is something that's very, very Disney Star Wars, is, is this sort of gesturing in the direction of the original trilogy and saying, we love it too, so if you, you know, yeah. And since we're dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, is it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you I washed my hands since last time I was outside and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, this is my first viewing of the movie, and between me, like, watching the entire movie and me recording this, like, I had lunch, and I recorded my video on, you know, season one, episode one, episode three of The Mandalorian. So, yeah, it's very fresh in my mind. 
So the plot. A young Han Solo tries to get back together with his childhood sweet teenage sweetheart his old sweetheart, Kira. And along the way gets involved in a heist or two and deals with some people that you really shouldn't trust. Now, yes, so quoting a few fellow critics here, a fun adventure after Rogue One and Episode Eight were heavy takes Star Wars back to its Saturday matinee serial roots with a sense of breezy adventure and devil-may-care charm. And they give it a three out of four. Now, I'm, so yeah, I'm progressive. I try to empathize with everyone, though if you are causing harm, you need to be stopped, you need to stop or be stopped, including if that means that the only way to stop your violence is for someone to get physical, as long as they don't go any further than absolutely necessary. And, right, so, the writing of this movie. Jonathan Kazdan and his father Lawrence Kazdan wrote this together and I have to admit I'm not really familiar with Jonathan Kazdan's other work. Let's see, he wrote some TV stuff including Dawson's Creek and Freaks and Geeks and he wrote and directed first time in the land of women. Yeah, not really anything. And Lawrence Kasdan, you know, bringing him back is a great sign. And it is, I, I have to admit, it's, it's a little, I thought the movie would be at least a little bit better written, but I, it might be all the reshoots that ended up making it look worse than now. Yeah, other than this, he wrote episode 7, Wyatt Earp, The Bodyguard, episode 6, episode 5, and Raiders of the Lost Ark. So, yeah. Now, yes, so quoting a few fellow critics here, this was not a story we needed told. The movie has no reason to exist other than profit. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think the movie is bad, but I feel like a little too much of it is kind of tied up in the sequels that they hoped it would get and that it doesn't really look like it's going to get, at least not anytime soon. I guess maybe some of it will end up on Disney Plus, but the I'd be interested in the sequels. It they they have they have interesting characters and setups here, but yeah, we did we don't really we didn't need to know more about Han Solo's backstory, and certainly if if something needed telling about his backstory this wasn't really the it doesn't really justify its own existence which i don't think all all creative expression does need to but with the, with something like this yeah it it really feels like they just they thought this was a sure thing, you know, everybody likes Han Solo, so why wouldn't you want, yeah, and quoting Philip Critics here, yep, the movie feels like it's necessary to tell us every single little detail that we know about Han Solo in episode 4, guns, names, where he was given every tiny insignificant thing it's as if everything interesting that happened in his life happened over one week. 
we see the Kessel Run and other things, and it is not that impressive. I like the Kessel Run scene fine. I I didn't think we needed to see it, and I don't think that. I th yeah, I, th I wasn't sure exactly where to say the following, so I'm just going to put it here. I enjoyed it while I watched it, but the moment that the end credits started rolling, it just felt really empty and like, you know, the, the it wasn't the, the sense of awe that I was left with at the end of episodes four, five, and eight. It wasn't, you know, I I didn't love episode seven, but yeah, you know, I I wasn't left feeling quite so empty. It just, you know, the the I don't know. To to some extent, it, the movie feels kind of soulless, like just a product. It's there to to sell toys and fill two hours, you know, get a lot of people to pay for theater tickets and and that's really and i i did i legitimately i enjoyed watching it i wouldn't mind watching it again i'm not sure it's going to happen soon but but yeah the the it definitely left me yeah this this empty feeling and yeah so more critic comments. It's supposed to be a heist movie, but it is not interested in the mechanics of the heist, which every good heist movie is. Appeals a lot to nostalgia with details from games, books, and of course the movies. It's like a fan film, but with a big budget. There are no politics, no alliances. It's just an adventure in the world, in, in the galaxy of Star Wars. The most interesting stuff that happens to Han Solo happens in episodes 4 through 6. There's no reason to make an origin story film. Hit and miss script. Moreover, the story really doesn't aim to tell a properly structured narrative. Instead, it felt like a Han's biggest hits montage all throughout. This is not to say it's hard and impossible to tell a proper movie about iconic person's events. We know, we probably know about and or have learned about or theorized about Themselves. Rogue One was able to do it to a maybe better extent. The definition of context the filmmakers had in mind with Solo was just throwing in fan service after fan service of what made Han Solo iconic, but we, really, we never really see why this character in this film in particular earned that iconic status. No clear plot. And. Right, so this is from Wikipedia. Writing for Rolling Stone, Peter Travis gave the film two and a half stars out of four, complimenting the cast but criticizing the lack of creativity, saying somehow Han Solo, the roguish Star Wars Hellion famous for breaking all the rules, finds himself in a feel-good movie that doesn't break any. A.O. Scott of the New York Times said it doesn't take itself too seriously, but it also holds whatever irrever irreverent anarchic impulses it might possess in careful check. He noted that it is a curiously low-stakes blockbuster in effect a filmed Wikipedia page. Yeah. Michael Reichstaffen of The Hollywood Reporter praised the cast and production values, but felt the film as a whole felt too safe. Writing while Aaron Reich solo proves adept at maneuvering the Millennium Falcon out of some tight spots, the picture itself follows a safely predictable course. Missing here are the sorts, sort of plot-related or visual curveballs done by Ryan Johnson's Last Jedi or Gareth Edwards with Rogue One. And, uh, yeah, according to IMDb Trivia, early versions of Han Chu's meeting involved a saloon-style brawl in a bombed-out building on Mimban. That could have been an interesting enough, uh, yeah. You know, in, in, part, parts of it are like of a Western, which, you know, that is the kind of thing, like a, a Western or a heist movie is the kind of thing that you want Han Solo in. And I mean it's it's nowhere near as good of a western. 
as the Mandalorian is, and I I realized that the Mandalorian I'm almost certain not a single episode of that had start had aired by the time this movie hit theaters, but you know I and and I don't think I. I think a lot of stuff that The Mandalorian does would only happen on a streaming service. I don't think we're going to see a lot of those same things in a blockbuster movie where there are very specific expectations. But yeah, it's just, it's not that great of a Western or heist movie. Now, plot twists. I think the movie handles them okay. An argument could be made that there's at least a few too many, especially near the end. Like, near the end, it kind of felt like they were just... They were more interested in surprising the viewer than... <sighs> yeah, it, it just... I've I've heard some some people say that they thought the ending was actually difficult to follow because so much happens in so little time and I myself I can't really speak to that because you know I've I've been hearing spoilers for this movie since it came out so I I have no idea what it would be like to go to watch the the yeah to watch this movie without knowing a huge amount of but yeah the the I don't think it's automatically wrong to have a lot of twists I, I if I had to say ultimately I don't think this has too many twists but it gets very close I, th I think even a single twist more in this movie would have been too many some of the twists are I'm, I'm not sure I would say any twist in this movie is bad but some of them are kind of middling and just meh they're not you know like jaw-dropping or anything and I would definitely say at least a few of them you kind of see coming it's not it's not ruined by that but there are a couple of things where you definitely they that will not surprise you. Now, the direction was handled by Ron Howard and yeah, so the movies by Ron Howard that I've watched on this are A Beautiful Mind Ransom Far and Away, Backdraft, Parenthood, Willow, and Splash. And, you know, they're all fine. I, I'm not sure I would... And Frost Nixon, I, yeah. You know, they're, they're not... They're not incredible. You know, the, the thing I've... I've heard people say about Ron Howard is he is competent but he has no discernible style like and that I, f I feel like that really yeah you know that's that's why he was brought in to replace the uh, I have their names right yeah, yeah Phil Lord and Christopher Miller who were the initial directors on this. And yeah, you know, the they took the movie in a direction that, you know, the studio wasn't comfortable with. And when you want someone that you know what they're going to give you, yeah, Ron Howard is, uh, yeah. Now... Okay, so, yeah, I have some IMDb trivia. So, 
Right, so uh, director Ron Howard has explained that he always tries to give his wife Cheryl Howard a cameo in his films. Since she is his good luck charm, she shot her scene for this movie, but it was deleted from the final cut. One day, Howard shared his regret over being unable to include his wife in the film with special effects technicians at ILM. They shot her against a green screen and digitally inserted her into another scene. So that's that's very sweet. And Howard was reportedly considered to direct Phantom Menace, but declined the offer, calling the task too daunting. And then 18 years later, he accepted the offer to direct this film. And, I mean, I'm not sure he would have made that movie much better than it was. I, th I think he might have been able to get more natural performances out of the actors than, you know, Lucas, I, I love a lot of his work. I think he's incredibly talented, but that directing actors was never his forte. This movie, he did a perfectly fine job. I mean, they, they had to rush through all these reshoots, and the story just isn't that... Isn't that necessary? Isn't that interesting overall? Now, after Ron Howard came on board, there was a question about who would receive the directing credit. Directors Guild rules state that a person who shot 90% of the film would get directing credit. Howard reshot 80% of the Lord and Christopher Miller's footage. As a compromise, Lord and Miller got executive producer credit, and Howard got the director's credit. So Phil Lord and Christopher Miller left as writers of The Flash to work on the film. They and original editors Chris Dickens left halfway through production, citing irreconcilable creative differences with producer Kathleen Kennedy and co-writer Lawrence Kasdan. A studio report reveals that Lord and Miller's com comedic screwball tone and free will and approach angered Kasdan, who wanted the film shot the way it was written. It also angered other production department heads, who complained directly to Kennedy. The final straw came during a two-week break while production moved from the UK to the Canary Islands. Kennedy Kasdan and replacement editor Pietro Scalia were shocked at the footage and decided to fire Lord and Miller. Now, Island Animation provided hyperspace footage that was projected on set during scenes in the Falcon's cockpit. Not only did this help actors feel immersed in the Star Wars world, but it also helped the camera department understand how to light the area and photograph it. And it does, like... You do get the sense it it those scenes feel more real and organic than you know those those scenes have never looked bad. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, you can really tell that this it it added a quality. Yeah. So quoting fellow critics, I wish Lucasfilm had had the nerve to stick with the original directors, Phil Lord and Crystal Miller, whose gonzo sense of humor, they made clear to the chance of meatballs, and the Jump Street movies, seemed like the perfect match for Han's personality. The Star Wars movies could use the shaking up, and this movie could have been perfect for that, since it's not only standalone, but entirely tangential. Apparently, Lord and Miller scared Disney with their comedic take on the character when the studio wanted an action movie. But their new director, Ron Howard, Inferno, The Beatles, Eight Days a Week, The Touring Years, has turned in action sequences that are incoherent. It's almost impossible to tell what's going on in most of them, while also letting the few attempts at humor fizzle. One big intended laugh is so completely underplayed and the dialogue so muffled that it's totally baffling. So, yeah, according to Wikipedia, on June 20th, 2017, citing creative differences, Lucasfilm announced that the directors had left the project with a new director to be announced soon. It was reported the directors were fired after Kennedy and Lawrence Kasdan disagreed with their shooting style. Lord and Miller believed they were hired to make a comedy film, while Lucasfilm was looking for the duo only to add a comedic touch. Lucasfilm also felt the directors were encouraging too much improvisation from the actors, which was believed to be shifting the story off course from the Kasdan script. To appease Kasdan, who was unhappy with scenes not, film, not being filmed board for board, Lord and Miller shot several takes exactly as written, then shot additional takes. Lord and Miller refused to compromise on certain scenes, such as filming a scene from fewer angles than Lucasfilm expected, thereby reducing the options available in editing. The duo were also unhappy when Lawrence Kasdan was brought to the London set, feeling he became a shadow director. 
I really hope that that Disney gets this kind of thing under under control for future products. This this thing with like suddenly having directors, you know, replaced and and having these extensive reshoots really hurts the final product of these films. And yes, again, I realize I'm obviously several years. I'm saying this several years after everyone else has said it, but. It really is like I it's it's they they really gotta get better at hashing out like figuring out ma making sure that everyone is on the same page as to how the final product should turn out now, wait, so quoting fellow critics here, originally the movie was. Yeah, it was being directed by the duo who did the Lego movie and Home on Jump Street. So they were good at comedies, a lot of improvisation, and that became too much for Disney, so they were fired. Replaced by Ron Howard, who's not exciting, but delivers what he's hired to do. And you can tell in the final film, because... Yeah, some of it was filmed by Ron, others by the duo, and it doesn't go together very well. We should have a director's cut of this movie. It is not as serious a Star Wars movie as the last couple. I didn't like Rogue One, but unlike unlike it, this did not feel like it was set in the Star Wars universe. That one was better shot, took more chances, had better action. World building for the Star Wars universe. Solo eventually finds its feet, and the movie gets better as it goes, but we feel throughout the tension between conflicting visions of Howard and Lord Miller, by and large, Howard delivers, although he does so in a typically Ron Howard-esque manner, with a solid movie that is eminently watchable, but very much in the realms of good rather than great. The new movie has been described as a space western, but I think it's more like a pirate movie, and almost pure fun from start to finish. Yeah, pirate movie makes a lot of sense. A thoroughly reliable addition to the Star Wars corpus, closely mimicking the spirit of the first two movies, the series, if not managing to recapture their magic. Certainly one of the most romantic of the ten films so far. The directors left Han in the background. The iconic solo deserved a better origin story. The seasoned actor could have would have demanded more presence, not a hobbled love story. A typical Ron Howard movie lacking passion. It would take a disaster of the science of an exploding Death Star to bump menace from the worst from the place as the worst Star Wars movie. Solo comes in second. It's a smorgasbord of fan service moments that practically look directly into the camera and wink, but each time it happens, the gesture gets less and less endearing. Solo is not a big time Star Wars movie, it's a good time Star Wars movie. Good times like the company that makes those terrible animated movies, Fellows were Fellows reviews? Yikes. Solo is prequel bad, and as anyone who really loves this franchise knows, there aren't a lot of things worse. As for the movie itself, my opinion is that it's a solid adventure movie in style of those great Indiana Jones movies with lots of fun and intense action, with the dialogue, great humor, and solid acting from all actors. In short, it's a meh movie. You can easily wait and watch it somewhere else for cheap. There's no amazing scene or something epic that you need to watch. The Han Solo movie could have been Ocean's Eleven in space. Yeah. The opening of the movie does a pretty good job giving uh, giving a sense of how bad... Like, at, at the start of the movie, Han lives on Corellia. And he's basically, like, he lives in the slums, and he's just, like, essentially, I guess, street hustling or something, you know, so something along those lines for this mob boss that takes I, I'm not sure we're ever really told I I would I would say probably at least the majority of the prophets and who really doesn't accept failure and you get a real sense of it's it's really yeah dirty and and grimy and you, you understand why he and Kira desperately want to get away from there. 
and this does not have the traditional opening crawl. It does open with some text. And I know some people really disagreed with that. I think it was the right choice. I think it works for the movie. Now, I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad. The ending fits what came before. I'm okay with how the movie ends. You know, to, to me, the worst thing about how the movie ends, and ultimately that is not the fault of the the ending of this movie, but the, you know, I, I just, I wish I, I could feel confident that there would be sequels soon, at, at least one sequel soon, that expand upon the ending, because by itself, the ending, the ending works really well as setup, but... You know, it's it's conclusive enough, conclusive enough for this movie, but you really want more. Now, there is no Deus Ex Machina. There's no convenient writing for the ending. Now, the movie never really lost my interest. As a prequel, you know, the words the, the word prequel is not always a negative, but the words Star Wars prequel tend to be. This I I don't think this is as bad as the, the prequel movies, the, the prequel trilogy. It's definitely not as good as Rogue One. Yeah, I I thought it was fine, like, it's probably, overall, I'd probably say it's better than episode 6. It's maybe around the same level as episode 7 or so. But yeah, you know, the, the big problem, one of the big problems with prequels is they provide information or characterization that actually makes the other movies make less sense and or be less satisfying. And... Yeah, you know, some of the things that Han brags about or, uh, you know, yeah, in, in the other movies, like seeing how it happened, yeah, you know, it, it doesn't, these are things, I th one of the major appeals of the Star Wars universe has always been that it doesn't feel the need to explain everything. There's a lot of things that are just said, and we we can tell how we're supposed to feel about it by contextual clues. But it's not like they're not they're mentioning places we haven't seen, people we don't know, things that have happened, but we don't know the details. And it makes the world feel more rich. And when you make a movie like this, that you know, shows these things. This movie does still have things that aren't spelled out, that are just implied, but yeah, it's just not. Like, if you're watching this video right now and you love the original trilogy, I'm not really going to recommend that you watch this movie. I don't think that it's, it doesn't make you love those movies more, it just makes you, like, it's, it's obvious that these, a lot of the stuff that's in this movie was not what George Lucas had in mind when he wrote and directed the, these scenes of Han bragging about things, or, you know, just, you know, when we see certain items Han has, the, the, little bit of backstory that, like, we see how he got the blaster, we see how Chewie got the bandolier, these various things. It's not really something that makes, that, that gives, like, a, a weight to it that, and, and, like, there's a, there's a little bit that does add weight, and several, like, some of that weight is not positive, but negative, but I'll get into that in the spoiler section. Now, so on the on the characters, this is one of those kinds of movies where it simply isn't going to tell you all that much about at least some of the characters. 
and some of the characters are harder to like or downright unlikable. So, Olden Ehrenreich as Han Solo, according to Wikipedia, when asked how Solo differs from Han's appearance in other Star Wars films, Ehrenreich stated, I think the main thing that's different is that the Han we meet in this film is more of an idealist. He has certain dreams that he follows, and we watch how it affects him as those dreams meet new realities, realities that are harder and more challenging than he'd expected. Harrison Ford, who portrayed the character in previous films, met with Ehrenreich, giving him some insight and words of advice. And, yeah, so, quoting fellow critics, he makes Han Solo his own, if not an imitation. It is impossible to play on Han Solo because Harrison Ford was basically playing himself. Han Solo is 75% like we know him in episode 4 from the start of the movie, so he does not grow that much they grow or develop much as a character in this movie. As an origin story, it is very weak. Good examples of origin stories where the leads change a lot are movies like Batman Begins and Doctor Strange. From the very first line, the director, the actor, says, We believe that he is a young Han Solo. And. Yeah, one critic has pointed out it is not true that the actor was so bad that he needed an acting coach. The acting coach helped all of the actors. As for Ehrenreich's performance, it's honestly difficult to tell how good he is. Remarkably, for a film called Solo, with so many characters, each one nibbling at the scenes, he hardly has room to shine. Ehrenreich isn't given much to work with here, but his sly comic reserve and devil-may-care attitude give you reasons to keep watching well after the story has stopped doing anything of the sort. While the movie ends in a way that's clearly designed to prompt further sequels, we don't get that prequel X-Factor that makes us interested in a character arc whose outcome we already know. Better Call Saul knows how to do this, Solo doesn't. Its performances, starting with Alden Ehrenreich as the young Han Solo, and extending to the film stealing Donald Glover as his wily frenemy Orlando Calrissian, are consistently entertaining. Despite the intermittent lags, the production proves to be more than a salvage operation thanks mainly to those engagingly choreographed performances led by an irresistibly charismatic title turn from Alden Ehrenreich, who ultimately claims Solo as his own even if he doesn't entirely manage to convince us he's Harrison Ford. Ehrenreich never seems to linger in a moment to find the right thing or scratch a sniff of sincerity for the most part. He's trapped somewhere between frat boy and fake soldier, which really isn't all that attractive. I can't, I wish I could argue more with that, but yeah, frat boy, yeesh, yeah, there's, there's definitely some, some real, real frat boy moments in this for him. Whenever Star Wars tries to develop one of the franchise's key characters, it whiffs. Solo is no exception, a disappointment on par with The Last Jedi and the prequels. When Solo is no longer one of the Star Wars' most enigmatic characters, he emerges from this film with enough backstory to satisfy the most dim-witted armchair psychoanalyst. You know, part of the appeal of the character is that we know very little about his background. How does a movie about the galaxy's most dashingly roguish outlaw end up being the safest Star Wars film Star Wars to date? Very true, it should be edgy. There are times when Solo Star Wars story gets it right, and all the measures of cool that generations have adored and emulated positively glow on the big screen, with an eye twinkle and naughty grin. At times, adequate, save for lead, who is miscast. This guy smiles through 90% of the movie. Ron Howard must have thought he looked more like Ford when he did so. He keeps smiling, Eric. My biggest reservation was and is Alden Ehrenreich. His depiction of Han Solo is not terrible, but is rather dry and lacks the charm and wit of his predecessor, Harrison Ford. We can't help but make that comparison, and those are tough shoes to fill. Ehrenreich is barely younger than Harrison Ford was when they shot the first Star Wars movie. He's already an adult, and clearly not too far from his meeting with Luke Skywalker and Ben Kenobi on Tatooine, so there's no temporal room for him to change and, or grow. He's a character on a treadmill. 
and yeah, it. I I think it was the right choice to not do a just imitation of of Harrison Ford. And yes, I know there are some actors who have the right age and who do just spot on impersonations of Han Solo. Yeah, of of Ford's Solo. I understand the appeal. I'm. I'm personally, I, I, I don't love when an actor takes over for another actor and focuses on imitation. I, I don't think, it's, there are times where it works out, but a lot of the time it just feels very awkward and it, it kind of draws attention to the fact that we're not watching the original. But... I understand why some people didn't like Aaron Reich's take. I think it's more the writing that does him disservice than the acting, personally. In a deleted scene and in the movie, Han Solo, you know, tries to talk himself out of problems that he ends up in because of his decisions. I thought the characterization was very on point. Like, this really does feel a lot like Ford's uh, solo. And according to IMDb Trivia, Alden Ehrenreich bought his copy of the Millennium Falcon Owner's Workshop Manual to set to talk about button sequences for a takeoff scene on the Falcon. Alden Ehrenreich was the first actor to audition for. Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, the director, said in July 2016 that while they liked a lot of the other actors with whom they read, the increasingly said the first guy we saw was the best for the part. Charlie Cox lobbied for the title role, even had screen tests with the producers he was eventually turned down, as they feared that his tendency not to keep eye contact, a trait required for his portrayal of a blind man in Daredevil, weakens the character portrayal. I, I haven't seen him in very much, but I do think that would be a problem for Han Solo, yeah. Dave Franco, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Miles Teller, Nick Robinson, Leo Howard, Tony Oller, Chandler Riggs, Hunter Parrish, Rami Malek, Landon Lebron, Lebron, I guess, Ed Westwick, Tom Felton, Ben Key, Eddie Westcott, Joshua Sassy, Logan Lerman, Ansel Elgort, Jack Rayner, Colton Haynes, Max Thiero, Scott Eastwood, Chris Pratt, Emery Cohen, Alden Ehrenreich, Taron Edgerton, Jack O'Connell, Blake Jenner screen tested for the young Han Solo. Now, I... There are a number of those that I do not know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna very briefly talk about the ones that I do know. Yeah, that I've that I've seen enough that I feel like I could give a, a decent idea. Aaron Taylor Johnson, I think, would have been fine. I'm not sure he would have been better, but he would have been perfectly serviceable, I think. I think Miles Teller has too much of a of an like the vibe that he brings, I feel like the things I've seen him in, I felt like I I could tell that, okay, this guy, this actor thinks that he's just the most amazing thing ever, you know, and I don't think that works for, that there are characters that works for, but not Han Solo. A Logan Lerman, I think, could maybe have done it. Scott Eastwood, I have to admit, I haven't seen him very much, but he does not appear to have very much charisma. Like the charisma skipped the generation there, because his father's had his father has it in spades. But yeah, I'm I'm kind of glad that he did. I I think he would have been really bad. It, it's, it's important for Han Solo to have charisma, and Alden Ehrenreich does. 
Chris Pratt, I mean, it's almost too obvious because his Star-Lord has a lot of Han Solo going on. Yeah, Chris Pratt would have nailed it. Taron Edgerton, I think he could have done it, at least. Alden Ehrenreich has a collection of old Han Solo toys. Jamie Costa, who played Han Solo in the short film Han Solo a Smuggler's Trade, wanted to play Han Solo in the film. He posted a video of himself auditioning for the role on his YouTube channel. Right, and someone wrote Woody Harrelson overused. No such thing is possible. And... Yeah, in March 2016, Alden Aaron Rayner and Taron Edgerton were on a shortlist for the role. Makes sense. Miller called casting the role one of the hardest casting challenges of all time, adding that they saw over 3,000 people for the part. I, I think that this is the movie where a bunch of YouTubers snarkily said, oh, you know, they just cast the first guy. No, they cast, they didn't just cast him without having seen anybody else. They went back later because he impressed them more than the ones later. They didn't just pick the first guy who walked walk through the door. I mean, like, you're perfectly entitled to not like him and think, you know, if you think he's the worst Han Solo ever, that's entirely, that's that's up to you. I'm not telling you what to think. But let's at least be honest. There's no indication at all that they just picked the first guy without. No, they, they, they saw, like, you know, apparently 3,000 people. And they kept thinking, you know, that first guy, he was really, really good. So they went back to him. It wasn't just without looking at any other... Woody Harrelson plays Tobias Beckett, a criminal and Han's mentor. The character of Beckett was based on Long John Silver from Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Incorrect. The pirate in Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island is Bluebeard. And, yeah, apparently Christian Bale was another pick for... I love Christian Bale. I do not think he would have been as good for this part as Woody Harrelson is. And, yeah, I think this was, yeah, I've, I've, one of my fellow critics said, Woody Harrelson was m made for Star Wars. He is a space cowboy in real life. He really is. Like, I, if I had to point to one character that just really works, it, yeah, he, he is... Again, it's almost, like, too obvious. Like, if Han Solo has a mentor, and for this kind of movie, you know, you want a mentor character for him. Of course Woody Harrelson's going to play the role. Emilia Clarke plays Kira, Han's childhood friend and romantic interest. Describing her character, Clarke said she has a couple of guises, but essentially she's just fighting to stay alive. If you've got a really glamorous lady in a really sordid environment, you kind of know the glamour is hiding a few rough roads. With regard to our character's relationship with Solo, Clark offered that they grew up as comrades, essentially. They grew up as pals, as partners in crime. There's obviously the romantic side of things, but they grew up together, so they were kids together, and... I... the, the two of them work fine. They, it definitely could be better, but you get why they want to try to make things work. And, quoting fellow critics, it's a perfectly enjoyable film, more so for those that are looking for some Star Wars material, new Star Wars material to consume, with no real development for the franchise, besides introducing Kira, an extremely interesting character. I'd love to see her popping up again in some capacity. The film didn't really utilize her at all. She's one of the, like... If we get a sequel, there's almost definitely going to be more stuff with her, and that really that would that could be very very interesting. They introduce us to Kira, who still has me intrigued. Our lady Emily Clark, she forgets that she's playing in science fiction war movie. Thus, she's more like going for shopping 
Ma or Joni Gala. She's constantly dressed up in Hollywood style dresses or whatever that is unfit for action. Okay, I, I don't think that the, the critic who wrote that actually is watching this video, but I'm still going to talk to them. You know that the actor doesn't choose what the character wears, right? Like, if you criticize the character, that makes sense. But criticizing the actor for what the character wears makes no sense. I'll grant that there are some movies where the actor has some input, but this almost definitely isn't one of them. Amelia Clark is a decent actor, but doesn't really work in the role she was cast in here, and you have to suspect that she was chosen to capitalize on Game of Thrones fandom. Maybe, yeah. I I haven't watched her very much. Like, other than this... Yeah, I, other than this, I guess it's just the the Terminator Genesis is, is all I've seen her in. So, I don't really know what she looks like when she's in her element. Because I wouldn't really say that that was her in her element either. But, but yeah, there's definitely some, some issue with her casting here. Now, by October 2017, Tessa Thompson, Naomi Scott, Zoe Kravitz, Emily, Emilia Clark, Kirsty Clemens, Jessica Henwick, and Adria Ajorna were being considered for the female lead. Okay, so I definitely think Tessa Thompson would have been better. Let's see, Naomi Scott... I'm trying to think of, you know what, I'm not 100% certain that I have seen her in anything, so I'm going to leave her out of this. Zoe Kravitz could have done it. Jessica Henwick, I think, would also have been good. And... Yeah, Donald Glover as Lando Calrissian. A smuggler, gambler, and self-proclaimed sportsman on the rise in the galaxy's underworld. Billy Dee Williams, who portrayed the character in previous films, met with Glover, giving him some insight and words of advice. And... Yeah, so, quoting fellow critics, It feels like Childish Gambino is imitating Lando... The, uh, Billy Dee Williams. It's a good imitation, but it is an imitation. And... Yeah, that does, uh, yeah. And another critic said, I wish Lando was the, the main character. And yeah, that, he's, he's, um, in, in some, in some ways, he's a more compelling character. And I do think that, yeah, I, I hope that they, I mean, there's a chance that maybe, you know, Childish Gambino will show up in a Disney Plus thing playing this character. I, I hope so. I, he, he was, you know, he, he brings life to, to, yeah. I'll, I'll admit I haven't seen Donald Glover in that many things, but. I've, he's never boring. He's he's there's always some interesting. Yeah, he he's he's really really good. This isn't a situation where Donald Glover shows up and it's so good he saves the movie. And don't get me wrong, Glover is great, but it's at this point in the movie that everything gets better. This is the part where the movie finally knows what it should have been all along: a root and toot and heist movie, and not an origin story. Perhaps because Lando was less explored than Han in the original films, Glover manages the tricky task of both paying homage to role originary Billy T. Williams while adding his own spin to the character. Like Ehrenreich, his version goes comic without tipping into outright spoofery. And according to Wikipedia, Donald Glover also expressed interest in the spin-off film, saying he, he would imagine it as Catch Me If You Can in Space. That, yeah, definitely would be interesting. But yeah, the he's one of the best characters in the and and the performances in the movie as well. 
and Thandiwe Newton as Val, Beckett's wife, fellow criminal, and member of her husband's crew. The way she and Beckett talk to each other, it's clear that they are a couple. They know each other really well, and, like, they're, it's, you know, he'll, he'll say something, and she'll call him on it and say, that's, that's BS, that doesn't hold up, you know, so there's, yeah. And Phoebe Wallerbridge plays L337. Yeah, that's that's Leet in Leet speak, or Elite for the uninitiated. In in the movie, they they call her L3 more than yeah. Lando's droid companion and navigator, and her character talks about improving rights for droids. Some hate her for being too feminist, and we feminists hate that the character being feminist is played as a joke. I don't think anyone was particularly happy with that aspect. I, I really wish it had been played more straight. I, I thought it was... I, I Every time it, it showed up in the movie, every time that someone brought attention to it, like, yeah, I, I was like... I mean, it really is about time the it's absurd the way droids have been treated in these movies right from the, the start and completely consistently but yeah it's played for laughs and just yeah i i think they probably hoped that people would accept like a, a spoonful of sugar kind of thing you know that people would accept oh Equal rights is a good thing, but I'm not, I don't know, I'm not sure, I, I hope so. I'm just not sure that I think very many people walked away with that. Yeah. Now, L3, according to trivia, was achieved through a combination of practical and computer effects. Phoebe Waller-Bridge wore a costume that consisted of the droids head, chest, legs, and arms with a green skin tight suit underneath screen suit was green suit was digitally removed in post production replaced with mechanical parts such as cables and wires during an interview on the Graham Norton show Phoebe Waller-Bridge said that prior to her casting she had never seen a Star Wars movie and didn't know what a droid was she decided to play L3 as a human in our audition when one of the, the directors asked her if she could be more droidy while making a mechanical hand gesture she deduced that droids are robots. Although the casting director asked her to try it again, they liked her original interpretation of the character and gave her the part. She does do quite well. Like, she's she's convincing in the... Yeah. Junas Suatomo as Chewbacca, Han's Wookiee sidekick and best friend, who also serves as his first mate. Suatomo reprises his role from The Force Awakens on Last Jedi, the former of which he acted as a body double for Peter Mayhew, R.I.P., and who portrayed the character in previous films. Now, I did not talk that much about the new actor for Chewbacca in my video on episode 7. I kind of felt like, oh, it's a spoiler that Chewbacca has a big role in the, in the movie. It's not a spoiler to say that he's in the Han Solo movie. He's really, really good in, in the role. Mayhew's legacy is safe with Swatomo. And yeah, the. Let's see. Yeah, so quoting fellow critics. A few minutes after Han Solo and Chewbacca meet, they already have the same relationship and dynamic that they have in the other movies, where they've known each other for much longer. This is an example of one of the things that we should see develop over a long period of time. Maybe they should only have that relationship with each other when the movie ends. This is one of the first times, not just in the movies, but also the books, where Chewbacca is a character. In most Star Wars movies, he is present, but here he has entire scenes where he's talking to people, and Han Solo has conversations with Chewbacca. Chew yeah. Right. He and Han Solo have conversations. Chewbacca is not just Han Solo's pet. He has a personality and motivations and I, I agree it's again it's really about time but this is also the right place to do that kind of thing you can put more focus 
on Chewie in, in something like this. And yeah, it, it works quite well. This is the first film to feature Chewbacca in a lead role, so to achieve his level of on-screen action. Production produced eight suits and ten heads. Ah, yeah, just like with, you know, when you, when you go out and you buy hot dogs and hot dog buns, they're never the same amount. The relationship between this Han Solo and Chewbacca are, is better than between Harrison Ford and Chewbacca. Wow. Now, according to IMDb Trivia, Jonas Suatomo wrote a heartfelt letter to Peter Mayhew saying that he was doing his role not just for Star Wars fans, but for Mayhew himself. Yeah, he, he is really, really good, and personality really comes through. And, like, in some of the other movies, you can kind of tell. I mean, at the start, George gave him, you know... And when when Chewbacca was first introduced, it was basically that George put his own dog in the movie, you know, and, and he made, oh, you know, Chewbacca's the co-pilot. Because, if I recall, it's been a little while since I, I read this, but apparently George would drive with his dog on the seat next to him, as, you know, not saying that's unique or something, but that's why he had this idea of, oh, you know, he could be on the seat next to Han Solo. And so he's just kind of, you know, sometimes he's playful, sometimes he's angry, and that's kind of it. You know, I, I don't know if if Lucas saw Chewie when, when he introduced him. I also don't know about now, but when he introduced him, I'm not sure that he thought of Chewie as, like, this really intelligent being. I think he might have just thought, you know, he's, you know, he's he's competent as a co-pilot. He's a good co-pilot. He's a good companion. But he's not, like, a deep thinker or something. And that by itself is also, it's it's fine, you know. But, yeah, if, if you make your pet a character in a movie, it does make sense for that to end up being kind of just he's he's there as other characters pet in instead of being a character with like yeah motiv yeah motivations and such paul bettany plays dryden voss a ruthless crime lord who has a history with beckett michael k williams had originally been cast but he was removed from the final film after being Unable to return to the set during the film's reshoots, Batney was cast in his place with the character being reworked from a motion capture alien, described by Williams as half mountain lion, half human, to a scarred near human alien life form. You know, it's it's never great when when a a, a, a black actor is replaced by a white one. I also have to wonder if maybe part of it is, you know, Paul Bettany and Ron Howard had already worked together on other things, so there was that sort of a, a rapport. But I do think that Bettany does give a good performance. And I think it was, like, it made sense for the, you know, this this doesn't have, the, the main villain here is not a Sith. And he's not looking to, to contr you know, dominate the universe or something. Because that, you know, that's not really the kind of person that Han Solo would come into contact with if he's not dealing with any Jedi, at, at least not before the events of Episode 4, at the very least. And, yeah, I, I thought they did a good job coming up with something that felt on his level. Now, some critics say that the villain is not very memorable. Yeah, yeah. 
according to IMDb Trivia, Dragon Ball's original concept art portrayed him as a dinosaur bird-like figure with the development of a love triangle. Let's see. Yeah, his design became more humanoid, majestic, and handsome in order to evoke more jealousy. And this is the third collaboration for Ron Howard and Paul Bettany. Howard previously directed Bettany in A Beautiful Mind and The Da Vinci Code. And it... I, th I think he delivers what is required. And I suppose... Hmm. I guess I won't say exactly who... Hmm. Yeah. John Favreau voices Rio Durant, a very cool and important alien character, member of Beckett's crew. Linda Hunt voices Lady Proxima, the serpent-like leader of the gang to which teenage Han and Kira belong. And Clint Howard appears, of course, as... Ha has he appeared in every single Ron Howard? I've, I'm, I forget, but certainly many. And Warwick Davis briefly reprises his role from The Phantom Menace as Weasel. I, I think I read somewhere that Warwick Davis appears in every Star Wars thing that's made after and including episode 6 where he played, I want to say it was called Wicket, the, the Ewok friendly to... Leia. And that it, it is really cool that he is what, what's the word? That that he Yeah, gets to appear and you know, he's he's played a number of different aliens across the films. You don't always see his face. Now, the, yeah, one critic points out, it's a problem for this movie that we know who appears in the movie set after this one. We can't get invested in the other ones. And that is definitely, like, for, for things like this, I try to think of, you know, there are other things that could be, like, for the, I guess that's technically... Well, yeah, I was going to say something about MCU, but then I'd be spoiling some of the MCU. So, yeah, what I'll say is, for this kind of thing, I try to think of, you know, if there's someone that the, the characters that we know, if there's other characters and they care a lot about them, then, you know, okay, maybe we, the audience, know that that other character, since we've never seen them or, you know, anything, presumably they die in this, you know, that's still going to affect the character we know and care about. And it's also possible that they live, but they want nothing more to do with them, you know, and I, I personally think that's, you know, I've, I've experienced both. There, there are people that you know, last I saw them, they were alive, but they want nothing to do with me. And then there are people that I used to care deeply about that died and both hurt. So I don't think that a movie, that it has to hurt the movie. That, that was TMI. That was TMI. I'll, yeah, uh, have that stricken from the record, Your Honor. Now... So, yeah, all the characters in this are morally gray. So, some of them are outright evil, but there are no good guys in this movie. This movie is set at a time where you can't trust anyone because there is no trustworthy government because of the Empire. And that is something that actually, parts of the movie, that works well. The... You know, at, at times, 
Ron Howard's direction makes it feel a bit too safe. The the you know he's not really known for creating an environment that is tense in in his movies, and that definitely does hurt it. Now. Yeah, so the, the, um, as far as diversity goes, you know, we have Fendi Newton, a black woman, and Kira may be white, but she is a woman. Yeah, there's not a lot, you know, it's, it's a lot of white guys. And, and Lando, obviously. And Phoebe Waller-Bridge, I I mean, you don't see it in the movie, but I'm pretty sure she is white. But yeah, a lot of, lot of white dudes in this movie. Very white dude heavy. And yeah, IMDb Trivia points out that Paul Bettany, Donald Glover, and John Favreau played comic book characters in the MCU, also owned by Disney. So, quoting fellow critics, in this movie, I liked the characters. They were interesting, not boring, like Rogue One. I liked the bad guy. He wasn't evil for the sake of being evil. It's good that we like the characters, because we already know Han Solo, Lando, and Chewbacca throughout this movie. But when there are other characters in danger, we are concerned for them. The stakes, gravitas, wit, and great actors dem demonstrating great acting. Rogue One, the best of these new Lucasfilms, are sorely lacking. Adequate is not what we want or expect from a Star Wars story. It may be the only official Star Wars feature that seems concerned exclusively with delivering No Frills Good Time. Unfortunately, the film's idea of good time includes neither dynamite banter nor particularly memorable action scenes. Watching a romance that, you are, that you're already super invested in blossom before your eyes is genuinely heartwarming. I was pleasantly surprised at how some characters. Yeah, the movie made me worry that anyone could be in danger, even knowing this was impossible. It was emotionally real. There's absolutely no spark between any of the characters. I suppose that's more or less. A, yeah, yeah, and that's a problem. I would watch a spin-off centered on any of the female characters in this. Same. I was really hoping these standalone films would be opportunities to tell new Star Wars stories about brand new characters and adventures, not filling in the gaps of stories we already know. But if we're going to get prequels about familiar characters, there's a screamingly obvious one that isn't being made. A Leia story. We arguably didn't need a Han movie because he already got a significant character arc in the, previous, in the prior films. Leia arrived in Star Wars fully formed, a princess diplomat spy who doesn't grow or change all that much in the trilogy beyond her romance with Han. How cool would it be to see her early life in Alderaan, see Alderaan, to find her adoptive parents getting caught up in palace intrigues, running clandestine missions for the rebellion. Instead, we're apparently getting a Boba Fett movie. Uh, you spoke too soon. But yeah, he's now on Disney Plus and uh, he has a show now. Not a movie. Oh great, now the Star Wars Disney universe is going down the same dark path as the prequels and the extended universe. Take literally everything mentioned, shown in the original movies and explain it. Especially annoying are in-universe explanations for things that are solely the consequence of out-of-universe stuff. Force Awakens had the perfect reference to the Kessel Run, but now we gotta explain. Yeah. So, the dialogue. The trio of Eric, Glover, and Clark might have made an excellent film had they been given better material than the exposition heavy dialogue in Solo. Would that it were so simple. Barbed Crips. But yeah, there's definitely. Like, it is. Yeah, way there's there's way too much exposition in in a lot of the dialogue and 
it definitely yeah it would, would have been a lot better now the cinematography is handled by Bradford Young who has done cinematography for 34 shorts 23 movies 7 documentaries 5 TV credits, 5 video credits and yeah so other than this yeah it's not really anything I've watched I thought that the cinematography was decent for for action scenes like for sure it's too dark the the lighting color correction is too dark but there are, there are at least some action scenes where it's very easy to follow what happens in, in action scenes. The director of photography, Bradford Young, worked closely with Panavision to find old lenses that suited the gritty look of the picture he was going for and to refine them for use on the film. By removing anti-glare coatings and slightly detuning the lenses, Young was able to achieve the imperfections he was exactly looking for. And, yeah, quote critics are too dark in the filming. For some scenes, that works, but others, like the Kessel Run, you just want to be able to see it better. It's like someone blowing smoke in your face. The star of the film is its black director of photography, Bradford Young. The skies were so oppressively gray. At first, I thought it was a metaphor for Corellia and another reason Han wanted to escape, but the skies kept on being gray for more than half of the movie. The cinematographer can't be let off the hook. He says his increasingly dark images are partially an artistic response to the dark times facing the world today, but that just makes it seem like he indis indiscriminately prefers low-light cinematography as a general statement whether it fits the film or not. Solo is intended as a light film, and its defenders describe it as such. It should have brighter colors. So the editing was handled by Pietro Scalia, who has 33 movie credits. And, okay, so the other stuff I know is Alien Covenant, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Amazing Spider-Man 1, Prometheus, 2010 Robin Hood, Body of Lies, American Gangster, Black Hawk Down, Hannibal, Gladiator, Goodwill Hunting, G.I. Jane, Quick and the Dead, JFK. Yeah, he's he's good. He's he's very talented. And the again, it's you know, some of the action scenes definitely the cinematography and editing don't keep it easy to to keep track but there are others where you do get a really it's easy to follow now the special effects are quite good as usual for one of these and they like with the other recent ones you know, the, there's a there's a sense of there's a uh, they're they're gritty. There's a, a it feels like people actually live in in this. You know, it doesn't just feel it's it's not as what's the word ah it's right on the tip of my tongue. Maybe it's maybe it's not. Okay, moving on. There's there's a good mix of CG and live action, you know, models and what's it called the the animatronics and such. So according to MVB trivia. 
a combination of practical effects, real dogs in costumes, puppets, and special effects, animated facial movement, were used in order to bring the Corellian hounds to life. Six Eyes is the most sophisticated mechanical head overproduced. It has 50 servos inside the head with onboard intelligence. Over 500 designs for the creatures were produced in the design process for the film. And it's, you know, it really feels, we, we get a lot of new creatures and robots and such that, you know, they fit in the galaxy of Star Wars, but they're not just something we've seen before. And, yeah, so, the, yeah, so one critic said, it's a noir western in space, and it sh so it shouldn't have the budget of episode 8. Of all the Star Wars themed movies, this one is the closest to a Saturday afternoon serial western. I don't expect more than that, but it could have been less. You can't see the budget in the movie. In, on, on screen because the, the reason it cost so much was all the reshoots yeah so the this was filmed on the Canary Islands in Italy let's see yeah so and and we get you know they add that what's the word the the ambiance of, of those places now according to IMDb trivia Twiggy Studio 54 and Vogue magazine during the mid 70s were the inspiration were the inspiration for the costumes of the yacht guests on Dragon Lost ship at one point the yacht had a pool and a team of artists was tasked with designing Star Wars swimwear and robes Creature effects and designs felt organic to the world, so that was nice to see. Ah, right, yeah. Back to critics. And everything looked and felt like it belonged in the Star Wars universe. So, the action scenes... It was... The action scenes, I found, were always enjoyable to watch and they tended to have weight to them. There tended to be enough of a sense of, of consequences, but there are maybe a few scenes where that's not the case. And we have chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights, shooting, including shooting while in vehicles. And we have some action scenes that aren't really like something we've seen in Star Wars before. There's one part where they're they're basically hijacking a train and you know it's it's like way up in the air and like I don't know I'm maybe it's magnetism or something but you know the the yeah the rails are are high up in the air and they're not like just on the on the side of something there's they're essentially suspended in in the air and yeah you know you can walk on top of the train as it's driving extremely fast and there are some that like walk on the side of it with like magnetic shoes and just yeah, some really, really cool stuff. And, yeah, some of the action scenes, there's a real weight to things. It really matters where the different characters are in relation to each other and to the objectives. And tactical moves matter a lot. They don't win easily. And it, it feels like they could lose. Which is not... I, I didn't really have that sense during episode 7. Well, wa watching episode 7, rather. And, yeah, according to fellow critics, the action scenes have weight and relevance. There's a lot of movies today where the action scenes do not have that. The action scenes are some of the most extravagant and grand we've seen in Star Wars. In the action scenes, Han Solo will sometimes use very creative methods to win.
Solo tied me out with a lengthy action scene about three quarters of the way through. There's a whole galaxy out there, but Ron Howard doesn't seem to realize it. His Han Solo prequel is a pedestrian journey through a series of inconsequential set pieces. The character development of its iconic protagonist is stuck to the surface. There are several surprising scenes that run the gamut of the best of what the Star Wars universe offers. Chases, spacecraft battles, shootouts, aliens galore, and lots of anti-laws of physics split-second solutions. And the score. This is the only Star Wars movie where it was scored by someone other than where where John Williams didn't do any new score for. It. Wait, yeah, they they don't use very much of John Williams' score. I forget if there might be at least one of the others where he didn't do new score. Anyway, this was scored by John Powell, who has. 62 movie credits now. Let's see, I haven't watched that many of them. It's Jason Bourne, Night and Day, Green Zone, Kung Fu Panda, Jumper, Born Ultimatum, X Men Last Stand, Mr. And Mrs. Smith, Born Supremacy, Paycheck, Gili. The Adventures of Pluto Nash. Yeah, I know, I know. The Born Identity. Evolution, Shrek, Ants, and Face Off. Yeah. I thought that he did a good job. The, you know, the the soundtrack. You can find it here on here on YouTube. It's somewhat different from the usual Star Wars score, for sure. I thought it worked for what the movie is going for. Now, one critic said it's one of the best soundtracks of any Star Wars movie. Yeah. And they worked in notes and light motifs from the traditional Star Wars score from the original trilogy. There are a couple of times where something will happen that we, you know, that we've seen before or something, or we'll, it'll be the first time we see a certain object or vehicle or such in the film, and they'll play some score from the original trilogy that goes with that, and that gets really, that gets real, real fast. And there's, again, great sound design. This movie has a lot of sex jokes. It seems like every single place they thought it would fit, they slipped it in. It was a significantly bigger part of this movie than I saw coming. Just a tip. That's nuts. Should I stop my penetrating analysis? And, yeah, quoting fellow critics. In this movie, the Imperial March is used to... Ah, what's it called? To, to get people to join the Empire, which is probably a joke from the two comedy directors. Originally, it was supposed to be a comedy, and when... Let's see. Yeah, and, and when they did reshoots, I thought it was still supposed to be that, but dialed down a little. But instead, they try to turn it into a drama, and it does not work. It feels like they're supposed to use comedy and jokes, but they never got around to it. Right, so the first two directors would use improvisation. There would sometimes be 30, what's it called, takes of just, you know, of, of a single scene each. And that means it took longer and cost more money, and that's why Disney stopped it. And 
And after a while, Han sounded more like Ace Ventura than Han Solo. And that's what they got. Harrison Ford to come in and help coach him. Even though Ron Howard only had three weeks, he filmed 70% of the scenes. Some of the scenes took one day for the first two directors. He did them in just a few hours. With Han Solo, of course, there's going to be sarcasm, but the comedy director duo they hired was not the they were not the right comedy directors for that. So the movie is two hours and six minutes long without any credits, and two hours and fifteen and a half minutes long with them. If you I feel like it's maybe worth watching just once. I'm not sure I would recommend more than one viewing, but and and certainly unless they do at some point make sequels or make something that follows up on this, I'm not sure I would consider this like if you're if you're not the kind of person who feels that they must watch every Star Wars movie, I th this one is a pretty good one to just skip. Now, the best scene for me is probably the the bank. That's the bank train. Yeah, the the scene with the the train. And uh, let's see, is it worth watching the movie at least once just to experience it? Maybe, I mean, if you watch just that scene out of context, like if you've got Disney Plus, you could maybe just find that scene, just watch it without any context, and you'd be fine. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. The worst aspect is that the movie feels unnecessary and is bland. And at the end of the day, I don't think it's a huge problem for the movie, but. It definitely does. You you feel it. Now, I was most worried that the movie would ruin established characters or other elements, and that didn't really happen. The thing I was most looking forward to was a Star Wars heist film, and the movie doesn't really deliver on that. Now, the trailers do give away too much, but they do also give you a decent idea of what the movie is like. If you know, if you watch the trailer and you want a full movie version of of the trailers, yeah, the movie that that is more or less what you get. Now, so on. Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 70% critic score and 64% audience score. And there are 482 critic reviews and over 25,000 user ratings. And the consensus is a flawed yet fun and fast-paced space adventure. Solo, a Star Wars story, should satisfy newcomers to the saga as well as longtime fans who check their expectations at the theater door. So yes, yeah, 70%, that means that 147 of the 482 were rotten. And the average rating is 6.40 out of 10. And uh, the, let's see, so yeah, 64% audience score, the average rating is 3.4 out of 5. But yeah, so that does, the, the movie is fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. And on Metacritic, it has 62 point, uh, so 62 out of 100 critic score and 6.1 user score. And the last, last time I checked, at least the last user review is from this December 27th, 2020. And on IMDb, it has a 6.9 out of 10 with 2,599 user reviews. And 
a number of them are negative, but there are some positive as well. I of of the I, I checked the 100 most voted most useful, and yeah, a number of them are negative. Let's see, at a glance, there's more than 43 negative ones, so yeah, it's probably, as far as I can tell, it's more than half of them that are negative. But the three voted the most popular are positive, so it's not everybody who, who hates it. And there are 556 links in the app external reviews section and I did not get around to those but yeah 319,165 MBB users voted for it and let's see 32.7 gave it a 7 out of 10 21.6 gave it an 8 17.6 gave it a 6 So yeah, yeah, that's not too bad of a, could be a lot worse. Yeah, that brings us... Right, so, a brief list of YouTubers who have made excellent videos on this movie that I recommend you watch. Jenny Nicholson, Turf Nation, and Pop Culture Detective. And I might mention them in other parts of the video. So, yeah, if you don't already, if you're a Star Wars fan and you don't already have Disney+, Plus, you know, that's all of the movies almost all of the shows, at least in some countries, you know, check before you, bef before you get a subscription, if that's what you're getting for, obviously. Now, these, yeah, there, there are some extras on Disney Plus for this, 13 minutes of deleted or extended scenes, and yeah, that is, that is not very much. I'd, I'd be interested in, like, I mean, I get that it's not what Disney was looking for, but if they shot that much of the movie, I think of, um, let's see, if we were to get a hashtag going, let's see, release the Lord Miller cut, I guess, something like that, I'd be interested in seeing how they got the, yeah, and, and like the parts of the movie that they didn't get around to filming. Because they were replaced, you know, just fill those out with what Ron Howard shot. And, yeah, I mean, if, if they put that on Disney+, Plus, I'll watch it. That's a, that's a guarantee. I really, it's, it's baffling to me. Like, I don't know, maybe they were thinking, like, you know, work for Iron Man, work for the first Iron Man movie to have a lot of improvisation, but... Yeah, I, I don't think it would work well for, for this movie. Anyway. So, I... Yeah, I give... I rate this seven unnecessary... Unnecessarily over-explained background details to justify putting out a prequel out of ten. And, yeah. I am... I'm updating my ranking of the film of the Star Wars films worst to best 2316 solo 7 rogue 1 4 5 and 8 and that brings us to the spoiler section. So, the rest of the video contains spoilers, including for earlier entries in the franchise, not ones released later but set earlier, only ones released earlier, even if some are set later. And yeah, the rest of this video is not a review. This is where the thoughts section start, and the rest of this is thoughts. 
some of its analysis, some of its MSCH Bay riff tracks, and other jokes. The time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts I had while watching, or in a logical order. You can think of it as running commentary, live tweeting, and the like. And the section after that is thoughts that I had before watching. So. That brings us to notes taken while watching. Yeah, the opening of the film does a really good job setting up how difficult and dangerous it is to work for Proxima and to live on Corellia. And they actually set up Coaxium immediately. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a little torn on whether it's just, like, it's it's extremely important. It's extremely important throughout the movie. So the fact that it's literally like there's really not is there a single scene where I, I there are scenes of this movie where no one says coaxium. But is there a single scene of this movie where there where no character in the scene is motivated by coaxium like yeah i i'm not sure there is i think every single scene you know someone is motivated by coaxium like even in the war scene it you know you you don't need to be a mind reader you don't need to be a jedi with the yeah force mind reading ability to, to tell that, you know, Beckett's just thinking about when he can get away so he can steal refined coaxium. Yeah, I, ultimately it's probably at least a little bit overly, like, like hypothetically, let's see. It could have, it could have been that it only showed up when... Beckett is introduced. But there is, of course, let's see. Early on, they, yeah, Kira has, wait, did he, right, right, Kira and Han have a little bit of coaxium, and then they give it to that Imperial officer in order to buy their freedom. And then later she hands him a little coaxium. So there's that, obviously. There's that element. I guess maybe it could have been... Maybe they only explain what coaxium is a little later. Hmm. Yeah. I, I definitely do think it's... There's at least a little bit too much mention of coaxium and, and motivation to... Everyone wants more of coaxium. And, yeah, the opening has a lot of lines where characters are saying to each other things that both of them already know. All I'm hearing are excuses. Not even good excuses. Bad excuses for excuses. Please tell me this is not your plan. Yeah, as plans go, this is rocky. Pretty good chase with the speeders. And I, it is legitimately clever. You know, they pres they, they prove to the, the Imperial officer that they have coaxium. And they're saying, you know, if you take it and let us two through, you know, you'll have coaxium. And that's, that's you know... If you, like, yell out that others should come and arrest us, then you're not going to get the coaxium. Those are some vicious-looking alien guard dogs, attack dogs. And we see that they're not letting anyone through who doesn't have a ticket, and anyone who doesn't have a ticket gets dragged away violently. And then, you know, he realizes, oh, you know, military. That's how I can get out of this danger. I appreciate the very realistic close-up look at Star Wars Warfare. Let's 
Stick to soldiering. You don't want any part of this. You just said the magic words. It's their planet, sir. We're the hostiles. Next is going to start talking about the duality of man. Well, now we got to shoot him. No. Oh, thank goodness. Han's safe. Snap his neck. Less mess. Oh. I like the gradual reveal on Chewbacca. The first time you watch it, you're probably expecting like a Rancor or something. Not a Wookiee, and certainly not this Wookiee. I like that the fight between Han and Chewie has both of them fighting dirty, like throwing mud and the... At one point, Han bit Chewie, which I'm not going to lie. If, I, if you told me Han Solo and Chewbacca were in a fight and one of them bit the other, my money would have been on Chewie. And the two troopers standing on top of the great supported by the column, were, of course, like old stormtroopers, wearing red shirts under their armor. It's actually part of the uniform. Good reveal that Rio is this monkey-like alien. You know, and Han says, I, I saw your one of your arms reach out and, and pull up your pants or so, something like that. We couldn't have done this, what, like, one at a time. It does make sense that Wookiees would have issues with boundaries. Chewbacca's technically always naked. When he hugs you, that is a naked person hugging you. It's not like they're asexual either, according to the holiday special. Never better. And we get a shot letting us know where she is in relation to them. You know, as train robberies go, this is pretty good. I wouldn't call it great. And with that pop culture reference out of the way, seriously, I do think it's a really great scene. And it's it's the kind of thing that you can do in Star Wars, but we haven't seen it in one of the movies before. And Enfys Nast really kicks ass. And Han releases the cables at the very last second. Yeah, I'm just very briefly going to talk a little bit more about the, the train scene you know they're the the thing with they have to unhook some of the some of the cars so that the the troopers on those cars won't be a problem anymore and you know there's that bit where they almost like if they're hanging off the side and there's like a mountain there they're going to get crushed so they have to get out of the way really quickly and you know the, the them shooting at each other is is really tense And Beckett explains about Crimson Dawn. I like that, you know, he, he basically gives, he tells Han, if you come in there with me and they see you, you're stuck in this life for good. He's just finishing with the regional governor and we see he killed him. Now that's an entrance. We know that this guy is seriously dangerous. And you immediately, the moment that we see Kira again, you immediately get a sense that something is very different for her. I like that Han, you know, they're discussing what, what do we do about, you know, the, now that we don't have this refined coaxium. And they talk about, you know, it's impossible to get other refined coaxium. And Han's like, what about unrefined? Very, yeah, very, very clever. Eyes on your own cards, buddy. All of them. You killed Aura Singh. Pushed her. Pretty sure the fall killed her. I mean, to be fair, she was just collateral. Collateral damage. Yeah, that, uh, never mind. That pop culture reference did not work, in fact. Or what? You'll wipe me? You wouldn't get to Honothana without me. She knows what she's worth. Very cool. Maybe too many capes. No such thing. Nothing is going to change the way I look at you. Watch the Game of Thrones finale, then we'll talk. We're not compatible. That's true. She's metric and he's not willing to convert.
And we see Kira kept the dice and give them back to Han for good luck. Surely you don't need those to negotiate. That's true, but don't call her Shirley. And we see that there are both robot and human slaves in the 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 spice mines of Kessel. And I think the reason for that is the same reason why there are human slaves on Canto Bite. It's because we're meant to empathize with them and we're not expected to empathize with robot slaves since they've been in Star Wars since the start and we haven't really been asked to empathize with them that much. Certainly not to the point where we want them to be completely free, just to where we hope that their new master will treat them well. Great. Only 11 more. Yikes. I 100% believe that Lando would dictate a book, apparently like a biography. I personally like the Slave Revolt. I just wish that it wasn't at least some of the time played for laughs and... If, you know, if it properly led to Star Wars treating slavery as as bad as slavery is in real life. And I'm also not really sure what the plan was for escaping if L3 had not started this slave rebellion that she didn't even, even she didn't mean to. Like, once it's going, she's like, I found my calling. But before that, like, she, like, she, she says it so casually, like, she, oh, buddy, buddy, can you, ah. Uh, Restraining bolts, barbaric, and you know she gets it free. Look, I just, I, I just need to use the pen. I, I don't know. I don't care. What? Go free your brothers. Whatever. I I'm I have a I have something I need to do here. You know, and then he actually does. You know, and then she's like, freedom. You know, I I just feel like there should have been a line or some like, you know, oh. L3 started a slave rebellion. I, I guess we're not going to need the original plan of XYZ. Lando, Han, Chewie. Okay, you really need to finish the rescue mission now. You are running dangerously low on characters to rush into the situation while other characters shout their name emphatically. Seriously, I, I thought it was a very tense scene. Like, you really did get the sense, you know... Again, obviously we know that Han, Chewie, and Lando are going to make it out of their alive, but i not going to lie, I cared when Lando got really upset at L3. Yeah. I don't know what that means. That's kind of funny. Usually, the, you know, the other person in Star Wars does understand the reference, even if the viewer doesn't. Until he crashed and died doing this. Great line. I'm not going to claim that it makes any sense whatsoever for it to be where it is, but that giant tentacle monster is pretty cool. Just did the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. Hmm, it changed it to make sense. 30 hired guns. All I gotta do is give the signal and you're surrounded. And then Lando flies off. That's legitimately funny. And, uh, like, really, why would Lando stick around? He, you know, he's, he's furious with Han. I don't really have a problem with the twist that Emphis Ness are, and, and the Cloud Riders are the good guys. I do think it's too early in Han's journey as a character for him to be a good guy helping out those fighting injustice. Beckett? Beckett didn't make it. It's empty. The case is empty. Empty, the opposite of full. That case was supposed to be full. I understand the argument that the ending here has at least one double cross too many. I thought it was fine. Very cool fights once it's only Han, Kira, and Dryden in the room. I hope you're still paying attention. Because now I'm going to tell you the most important... <laughs> Han shot first. Very cool. You made the right choice, kid. I would have killed you. Got that, audience? It was self-defense. It's not morally questionable.
and Han grabbed the card from Lando's cheating doohickey so that he could win the Falcon back. Quite clever. And that brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. Yeah, so I've already mentioned, uh, you know, I would like to see something following up on this. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm guessing it's not going to be a theatrical movie anytime soon, but, like, today it's fairly, like, you could, I, I don't know, uh, use Twitter maybe. It's, um, I feel like today it's it's not that difficult to gauge the interest in in like certain stories being told and such. Yeah, maybe maybe a Twitter hashtag or something. Find out how many people actually want and what they want to see a sequel to this. I would I I think an entire movie focused on Lando, an entire movie focused on Kira. I you know those would definitely work. A prequel showing more of L3, honestly. Yeah. The... Yeah, maybe maybe like do a, a Disney Plus series where every episode follows up on something in this. And some of it may be prequel. Yeah, yeah, do like a pre an, an episode that's a prequel for L3. At least one episode that's a follow-up with Lando with Childish Gambino still in the role. At least one episode that follows up on the Kira storyline. Yeah. Now that let's see. So quoting fellow critics, I wanted to see him actually be a greedy smuggler, but he's just smuggling to fight the Empire. That's not the kind of dark backstory we want for Han Solo. He's already a good guy here, when that was something he learned in A New Hope, and this takes place before that. We spent too long on the love story. We already know that they're not going to end up together. He ends up with Leia. Bad chemistry between the two, between Han and, and Kira. Uh, let's see, yeah, that was the... Some people think that Han Solo starts as an idealist, ends up being cynical. Others say he starts being very cynical, ends being as idealistic as he is by the end of episode 4, where he starts being outwardly really cynical. Darth Maul should not be in this movie. It feels like Disney felt like they had to, to do like with the MCU, with these with tying everything together. Only one story in this. It's the first Star Wars movie that doesn't have at least two stories. I like seeing Kessel Run. Some of the most interesting characters are buried in the movie. L3 become... Ah, what's it called? Be, yeah, becoming part of the ship's computer is the absolute last thing she would have wanted. Lando and L3 definitely had sex. Lots of betraying going on, so it's really obvious. Lando isn't in a good situation yet. He's trying to bluff his way out of the bad situation he's in. Not the most interesting bad guy, but I do think that he actually cares about what happens to the people he works with. He's just having difficulty controlling his temper. It's good in the original trilogy that Han is a normal person. He's not related to anyone important. This movie makes him seem more important than he is. Some people thought it was really impressive when mask the mask comes off and Enfys Nest turns out to be a young woman, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what they... She's, she's fairly young, and... I guess we weren't really expecting her to be female either. 
you know, they, they did the thing with the voice. Her voice is, is changed by the something in the mask or something, which, you know, that's that's a bit of a Star Wars thing, isn't it? If you if you have a helmet or a mask, you're, you're, it changes your voice at least somewhat. I like the idea. I, I you know maybe they're going for like if some kind of Greta Thunberg, young women will save the world thing. Yeah, I I I didn't. It didn't like floor me when I found out. Which to be fair was before I watched the movie, so maybe it would have. Yeah, it, it could have been a more compelling, like, there are a lot of times in, in Star Wars movies where someone will take off a helmet or a mask, and a lot of the time it will, we will have a strong reaction to it, but here, it's, yeah, you know, like, in episode 6, when, when Leia removes it, and we see that, you know, because we thought it was some bounty hunter up until that point. And Vader taking it off to look at Luke with his own eyes just once. Now, back to what other critics said. It was supposed to be part of a trilogy, and that's why Han Solo does not get much of a chance to develop. He starts being a good guy, ends up still being a good guy. According to interviews, Lando is pansexual, but that's not in the movie, so it doesn't count as representation. Which really, I mean, I get, you know, I, I Disney's probably not going to put it in the movie, but still, that would be really cool. And there's definitely, like, there are some very clear references, like, yeah, for sure, L3 and, and Lando have been together. And yeah, back to credits. The slavery element doesn't work. It's messed up, not treated with respect. They didn't really know what to do about the Kessel Run, so they just put a monster in there. Han Solo in this one loses too often. He definitely does lose a lot. I don't know. I yeah, maybe a, maybe a little bit too often. Yeah, I I can kind of see that. Yeah, but the I I thought that it really. Like this movie, he really very frequently he'll he'll be trying to do something and it'll fail, and that is that does happen a lot with his character in the original trilogy. I guess maybe maybe it's too much that he's this much that that he that so much of the movie is about him and not you know there isn't a, a Luke or a Leia around to draw away some of the attention and so you know I'm, I'm not sure he fails that much more frequently in this than he does in his original trilogy scenes but in that in in the original trilogy the, the him losing is more spaced out because we'll see other things stagecoach robbery in Star Wars Galaxy since Western in space that does yeah make a lot of sense Climax is a shootout since Western in space. Han and Kira kiss each other four times in this movie. Twice in the same scene, which is excessive. It would be interesting if it started out with us thinking that Dryden Voss was a good guy. There should have been more mystery about him. Yeah, I think that could have been interesting, yeah. If Enfys Ness was supposed to be shocking, we see it's a young woman, maybe she should have been an actual child. She's not young enough for it to be a strong twist. Climactic action scene. It looks like Hira is fighting Han, but she's just pretending because otherwise she would not get a good chance to kill Dryden. But then we see right very shortly after that she's not a good person. Yeah, yeah, that really was like if Yeah. Instead of Darth Maul, it should have been Snoke. So Kira was lured to be good by Han Solo. And so Snoke wanted revenge by turning Han Solo's son evil. Yeah, that that definitely would have been a, a quite cool and and you know that is a thing because this movie did come out after episode eight when everyone 
was talking about how he we we really didn't learn anything new about him and not not everybody hated that but certainly it was expected and and there was a sense of just yeah i i don't personally mind that much but i do think it would have been good for this movie to give a little yeah the character deaths in this movie will leave you feeling angry as they are unearned and disproportionately affect women yeah that's very true. There is a hashtag. Hashtag make solo two happen. Which okay, so yeah, so this is from Wikipedia. On May 25th, 2020, fans again used the hashtag. Hashtag hashtag make solo two happen. Show their appreciation for the film on its second anniversary. The hashtag went viral with fans arguing that the film deserved more praise and once again Calls were made for a continuation of the story. A number of people tweeting with the hashtag expressed their desire to see more of Amelia Clark's Kira. Rudyard Roche of Comic Book Research said that by far the most interesting part of Solo is Kira's turn, and any follow up film needs to focus on her. Writing for Cinema Glenn, Dirk Libby stated it seems unlikely that the Solo 2 fans will get the movie they want. Of course, some don't actually need a theatrical follow up. They would be happy with a Disney Plus series that didn't even necessarily include Han Solo, but instead focused on the criminal organization being run by Kira. Very much so. I would, I would, that would be really, really cool, yeah. And, yeah, so, I'm to be trivia. When Han enlists on Corellia, he gives his name only as Han, and the Imperial recruiting officer gives him the last name Solo. This is a tribute to The Godfather Part 2, when the customs officer on Ellis Island changes Vito Andolini's name to Vito Corleone. Mandor represents the travel towards the new frontier, typically seen within the western genre of the Rocky Mountains. Chile, Patagonia, and the Dolomites in Italy served as inspiration for the rocky, snow-tipped mountains of the planet. Rick Ron Howard often shot eight to nine minute takes of the actors in the cockpit during the castle run, creating an atmosphere that reflected the stressful and exhausting nature of Han's feet. American West artists Frederick Church and Albert Bierstadt served as inspiration for oh, when designing Savarin. Savarin also came to represent the end of the road for both Han Solo's and the audience's symbolic journey across America. South California, a, desert, a place where the desert meets the sea, the end of the continent, and the birthplace of the modern film industry. Han's entry into the Imperial Military mirrors James T. Kirk's entry into our fleet in the Kelvin continuity of Star Trek. Both grew up in an area where ships for the fleet are constructed. Both enter their respective academies in after an adolescence marked by petty crime, and both vow to become exceptional pilots. Three years after enlisting, Kirk becomes a starship captain, while Han has been kicked out of the academy and relegated to be a grunt in the Imperial Infantry. An early version of the solo screenplay involved an elephant-sized naked mole known as Awapota that would slowly chase after Han and Chewie with a giant drill attached to its face. Duff Mole was originally not meant to be in the film. During the writing process, the head of the Crimson Dawn was referred to as Boss, and a list of potential characters to fill the role included Duff Mole. Ron Howard lobbied hard for Mole, Duff Mole to fill that position, and it ended up in the final film. If you read just user reviews as I did, there are people who think that that means that the movie is set before episode one. I guess they missed the robot legs, and you know, if you don't know about, I I I've known for a few years now that Darth Maul, you know, apparently survives and is in not one but I think at least two of the animated shows but if you don't know that and you watch this and you miss the robot legs yeah like so, some people gave it a negative review it, at least in part because they thought that that meant that the movie must take place before episode one which obviously doesn't make any sense with the age of Han so yeah I I don't know I I, I have no idea the percentage of people who were confused versus the the people who thought you know who who maybe didn't like it but at least understood it but yeah they definitely did mess up at least some yeah 
Moss scars look like someone raked a lightsaber across his face, and he says he's now, he knows the price of failure. Maul would be the kind of person who would punish that way. The scars down his face also visually resemble Maul's facial markings. Yeah. Han Solo. So, you're Han alone? Mister, I'm a grown man. Do you think I don't know my own people? I don't think so. My mom's in the car. My dad's at work. I'm an only child. I won't tell you where I live. You're a stranger. Oh, it is not the most random reference I've put in one of these videos. Now, as for it not making sense, well, that one I cannot argue with. Seriously, about how he gets his last name, obviously we all think it's a bad way for that to happen. I think the movie should have done... I think what the movie should have done was go the entire movie with him not having a last name. Like, he keeps introducing himself to people... I'm Han. Han what? Just Han. And then at the very end, because he's decided that he's going to be on his own, he introduces himself to one final character. I'm Han. Han what? Don't you have a last name? What is it? And then cut to the title screen and the end credits start rolling. I'm not saying it's amazing, but it's better than what we got in the movie. I do quite like Jenny Nicholson's version of how the scene went. I heard a story about you. I was wondering if it's true. Everything you've heard about me is true. Even the stuff that contradicts the other stuff? Especially the stuff that contradicts the other stuff. So Darth Maul, in, uh, in Hologram, uses telekinesis to grab his lightsaber and then he ignites it because this is a Star Wars prequel and not The Phantom Menace. So if there is a lightsaber, it has to be ignited at a time where it doesn't matter at all for it to be ignited. And so since Lady Proxima cannot, you know, she's, she's hurt a lot by direct sunlight. So obviously she makes sure not to have any windows in her base's, like, personal room. Okay, so she doesn't do that. But certainly she covers those windows with, like, thick material stolen by all the orphans who work for her. Oh, no, wait, never mind. It's actually so frail you can smash it by throwing a rock through it. Thankfully, the... The sequence would have worked without him throwing that rock. Oh, no, never mind. And that's when you realize, as a viewer, that this movie might actually be this badly written. It actually, I, I don't think the rest of the movie is that badly written, so I, I don't know how that ended up in the final movie. They should have just come up with some, like, Han and Kira are both there. So just have some kind of, like, Han will say something very specific, and that will be a, a signal for Kira to do something, and together they manage to escape. But the having the, the yeah, the way the scene plays out is just silly. I quite like that Han hustles Lando with, I want to say, it was, it was called Bacot. But he intentionally says, but the cat? Oh, I don't know. I, I guess I'll try to see if I can't pick it up as, as we go along. So, uh, and, and he starts talking about like, ah, oh, you know, I, I would never bet something I love like my ship. And that, you know, so Lando's like, oh, I want his ship. And, you know, we, the audience know he doesn't, he doesn't have a ship to bet, you know, and I've, I've seen some say, well, why does, well, when the game is over, why does Lando accept that he doesn't get a ship? Because there's other ways of making money off it. He's, it wasn't a ship very specifically, like he just wanted something valuable out of it. You know, that's why he wants a percentage of the, yeah. Personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with the idea of human beings having sex with robots other than consent, which is obviously a very big problem. 
Now, Jenny Nichols and, and Pop Culture Detective both do a really great job explaining the problem with robots as slaves better than I can, so I recommend you watch their videos on it. I, I will just briefly say, I already quoted another critic saying, you know, it's extremely messed up that L3, who spends all of her screen time talking about how robots deserve freedom, is made a slave, turned into the Falcon's guiding system, and the movie actually celebrates it. So, you know, oh, it's like this heartwarming thing. It's the last thing she would ever want. Now, some people don't like that the fuel is transported on a train. My thinking is, the logic is, there's like, you know, if, if they try to fly the the fuel through the same area, there's some chance that the, like, maybe there's some some storms in the area or, or something, some, some kind of natural phenomenon that means you can't fly straight. And because it, you know, we, we already know that the, the, even refined coaxium is unstable. You know when when the ah what's it called the when we see it, it you know I forget yeah I think it's it, Han like cuts the wires and it falls down and then they fly off and you know huge explosion. Would you really want something like that on your ship? And and it's not like they don't have any security or something. You know they do have those troopers. And the, the troopers actually do manage to prevent at least some of the coaxium from being stolen. Like, it's... I'm of the opinion that the fact that for a while it, it seems like they're going to be able to leave with the coaxium, it doesn't make the Empire look careless. It makes the, the you know, Beckett and his crew look especially competent. I've I've seen some people on YouTube criticizing the Kira like she like shouts right before she throws the the I forget if it's a thermal detonator but some kind of grenade I'm almost 100% certain it's like uh it's something to do to scare the opponent to not shoot you know if, if you're if you're trying to shoot someone and they'll like shout it's gonna like you're gonna be like, whoa, what what was that? You know, what was that about? And not shoot. If she doesn't shout, there's a greater chance she's gonna be shot. You know, if as essentially she is completely unprotected for the couple of seconds that she spends throwing the, the grenade. You know, and, and you know, oh, but she could have like a gun and be firing at the same time. Well then she would have a lot harder time of of aiming the grenade though. Now, some years back, I was in a toy store, and there was this, like, I think the problem was that there was only one Millennium Falcon toy left, and, and like, it came down to, there was, there was these two guys. One of them, I don't think he was even, like, he didn't even care about Star Wars. He just knew that it was like, oh, this, you know, this is gonna earn a lot of money on eBay or something, you know. And the other guy, like, he was, he, it was his life. I, I, he was actually, he was dressed up as a character. I forget. He was Han. Yeah. Now that I think about it, he was dressed as Han Solo. He wanted the Falcon, you know. And they were like, they, they both had, uh, you know, their, their hands on, like, trying to pull. Trying to trying to get it out of the other one's hands, and then like eventually, I think just to troll him, like the guy who didn't even care, just e you know, it's gonna be eBay fodder, you know. He he just he lets go, and the ship hit the fan. That was way too long to go for that punchline, and with that, if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two, or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts of my movie, 
and one talking about the most recent episode that I've seen of The Mandalorian, and recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.